good evening everyone uh, thank you for joining us for today's session our guest this evening uh, mr ajay choudhury needs no introduction his name and his body of work speak for him uh, yet for those of you who are not very well versed with his profile he's a padma bhushan he's a founder of hcl and he's the former chairman of hcl infosystem Uh, he has also been ardently supporting the Indian entrepreneurial community by being on the board of Indian Angel Network, and he has invested in quite a few startups. And to, uh, today's session will be on building a business from traction to scaling up. And who better than Mr. Chaudhary to conduct this session? Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, it's a privilege to have you. you, and the platform is all yours. Thank you. well basically uh, what i am going to do is to talk about uh, the hcl story how we started how we uh, grew to a uh, number one it company and then grew globally and the whole idea from this story is to tell you that how uh, you create traction in the beginning and then how you scale up in india and globally so that is going to be the uh, strategy that i'm going to follow as i tell you this story and as you as i keep telling you about hcl uh, i will tell you a lot about things that we did well things where that we didn't do well and things where we totally failed so that you will understand how when what we did when each of these things happened and i would also like to bring in some concepts that i have used uh, while creating the company so that some of those strategies and concepts you can use as you build your company so with that i'd like to go to the next slide well we started in uh, 1975 and uh, india was under emergency some of you would not even be familiar with it and some of you would not have been born then emergency literally mean that indira gandhi uh, actually decided that uh, uh, since she was having trouble with her election uh, situation she announced an emergency and as a result of that uh, there was a clear uh, you know imposition of in a manner an autocratic rule for that particular period of time but why am i talking about india under emergency why i am talking about it is that whatever be the environment around in the country you can still create a business whether it is positive or negative so if you look at it today for example you are sitting in a covid environment where literally all offices are not functioning properly a lot of uh, Uh, commercial establishments and manufacturing is not functioning properly but should you at this stage start a business yes you can because is is the environment is not that relevant in certain cases and if you actually have a great idea and a great team you can start whenever you want okay so let's go to the next slide what happened during emergency when emergency happened literally all the opposition members of the country was put behind bars so literally indira gandhi had no real uh, opposition at that stage and she could do what she liked so all kinds of things happened but one good thing happened at that time that everything worked perfectly so if you were to catch a train it was always on time if you were to catch a flight it was always on time so people were so scared that every government office was working on time and would deliver whatever they had to deliver so it was a very interesting period where uh, yes people were very scared but also things worked next slide at that particular time india was a closed market literally nothing was be allowed for importing and at that stage we wanted to start a technology company 
and no imports were allowed into the country for technology. And there were just 100 computers in India at that particular time. And also, funding to get started was very, very difficult. There was hardly any, any way of getting money except to go to a bank. There were nothing called angels. There were nothing called VCs at that particular time. Only banks would give you some money, if at all. So it was a very closed market. India was a very small, uh, small, uh, eco very small economically, and really a very, uh, 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 very interesting market where to start. Because naturally, if you have just hundred computers in the country, the opportunity in the market is huge. So that's really what prompted us to think about starting a computer company to manufacture computers and to uh, market them all over the country. Next. So what was the idea? The idea was that the microprocessor was just coming into the world. And we sort of dreamt that if we could take the microprocessor, we could actually change the world. And that's really the way young people think at that particular time, whenever they're thinking about doing something new, they think about, okay, what can I do? And fundamentally, we said, we'll take the microprocessor and create computers from them because all computers till then were not made from microprocessors. Everybody used to design their products ground up and would create their own uh, processor. But we when we six of us got, got together, we could only put together 1.86 lakhs among the six of us. And that was a very small amount of money. And our dream was very big. We wanted to design and manufacture a computer. So what we felt was that instead of straight away going into uh, the manufacturing piece because we didn't have enough funds, let's start a marketing company. So what did we do? We started a little marketing company and it was called Microcomp. Microcomp was basically a short form for microprocessor. And what we said was that let's go and pick up uh, calculators we had actually, six of us were actually working for DCM at that time, DCM Data Products. DCM Data Products was a leader in calculators and had just come up with some computers. So we said we have great experience in marketing uh, the calculators. Why don't we do that till such time we can set the ground rules for creating uh, the computer company. So that's what we did. We formed Microcom. We picked up calculators from a company called Televista, who used to make TVs, they didn't know how to market calculators, so picked it up from them. We worked out a model by which we could pay them after 60 days, and we started selling calculators all over the country to create some funding for our future computer company. Next. So that's the six of us. Uh, this picture was not taken at exactly at that time, but uh, a little later, but that's the six of us and uh, that's how we got started and uh, as we were looking at starting the computer company the environment was very tough and that's what i talk about that how do you look at the environment how do you still find a solution even in a difficult environment and the difficult environment for us was the fact that if you wanted to start a computer company you needed a license to manufacture computer and who were in India at that time would give a license to a startup. But when we looked at this problem, we didn't think of it as a problem. We said, we need to find a solution to this. And therefore, what we kept doing as we were creating this marketing company and creating funding, we also started looking at who are the people who have licenses and who are the people who are making computers based on those licenses. And we happened to find that the UP government was sitting on a license, but they had no idea how to actually go forward and design and manufacture computers. So we went to them and said that, look, you have a license. We have the knowledge and the capability because we have created DCM data products. And why don't we join together and go forward? So that's what happened. We formed a joint sector company with UP government. They took 26% equity. We put in 74% to get started. But the benefit of starting at that stage with a government company was 
that we could also get loans. And because of that, we were able to get special loans from the UP government's finance company. And that's how really we got started into looking at designing and manufacturing computers. Next slide, please. This is really where we started originally. Typically, a lot of computer companies those days globally were born in garages. Uh, well, we sort of were a garage operation, but we were not born in a garage. We were born in what is called a Barsati in Delhi, which is a little room on top of a home. And this was the home of one of our co-founders. And he said, why don't you use this little home, little room on top of our, my home? And we got started there. At this moment, you see some telephones on this desk. Actually, we didn't have a single phone. Getting a phone those days was a five-year affair, but somehow we managed to get them later. So that's exactly where we started in a little Barsati on top of the house of a co-founder. Next. Next slide, please. So, so 1976 is when we actually signed up with UP government. And this is actually the signing ceremony of uh, forming Hindustan Computers Limited. That's really what we call this company. Now, why did we call it Hindustan Computers? First, we felt that we were a startup, although we were joining up with a UP government agency, we were still a startup. And for us to go and compete with large companies that existed at that time in the computer business, and I will talk about who were the competitors at that particular time, we would need to look larger than life. And how do we look larger than life? The name of the company was therefore very important. We called ourselves Hindustan Computers Limited. Those days, the name Hindustan was really used by either large public sector companies or large private companies like Hindustan Lever. And we said, if we call ourselves Hindustan, I think it will give us great positioning in the market. And that's really what happened when a salesperson from our organization would walk into a corporate organization to sell a product, he would get easy entry because the name looked so much bigger than what we really were. Next. Our first product that we decided to bring to the market was a four bit product. I mean, today you talk about quad bits and octo bits and all that, you know, huge uh, processors that are used even in phones. That time, a four bit microprocessor is what we started with. It is called a Rockwell PPS4. And uh, we decided to make a scientific computer to start with. We felt that the scientific market was going to be a lot more friendly to us because we were a bunch of young engineers. And we felt that if we went to research institutions, IITs, engineering colleges, they would really go out to support us as we were a bunch of young engineers. But as we were designing the product, we realized that it will take us time to design, time to manufacture, and therefore, what we did was that we created a beautiful brochure of the product. We knew what the product was going to look like, but the product wasn't ready. So we told, we got a bunch of great salespeople that we put together. We went to IAMs and said, we want to hire some great people who can join us for product management and sales. And we went to IAM Calcutta. And when we were making a presentation about our fledgling little startup, the question that we were constantly asked is, why should we take the risk to join you? You're a startup. And we, we are getting such great job offers from all big companies. Why should we you know, waste our time listening to your presentation or join you? And you know what our answer was? We said, we are not asking you to join, take a job what we are giving you is an adventure. And you'll be surprised. What we did was that we, we uh, gave the highest salary at that particular time in the marketplace for IAM graduates. The surprising part was that, yes, that salary was just 2000 rupees, but that was the highest salary in the market in 1976 for an IAM graduate. 
and we were going to pay them higher than what we were taking ourselves. So we said, come join us for this adventure. Six people joined us. And what we did was that we launched the product with a fantastic brochure. The product was under development in our R&D in Delhi. And our salespeople were told, go sell this product. And we gave them fantastic training on how to sell a product as a concept, how to sell a product when no con product existed, and how actually you would go and sell it to a prof in an IIT. So we actually taught them all the strategies of how to do that. And we, in a manner, taught them the whole concept of what is called transaction analysis, where you actually appeal as a student to a professor and go and sell a product. So without having the benefit of a product, we started selling the product. You'll be surprised. IIT Kharagpur was our first customer. And then every IIT placed orders on us. And many research institutions placed orders on us. And this we are talking about August of 1976 onwards. But everyone told us, please make sure that you deliver the product before our financial year ends. We are taking a risk on you, but please make sure that you deliver. And you know what happened? We could barely manage to deliver our product by March of 1977. As a matter of fact, I was running the Southern business and I was located at Chennai and I had picked up orders from IIT Madras. I personally went to the airport on 29th of March in my beat up old Fiat and picked up the product, brought it and personally delivered it to the professors. So that's how HCL got formed. If we were actually failed in delivering the product by 31st of March, there would have been no HCL. So that's not what you do. You really take a risk, you create a strategy, and then you overcome the objections that you're going to face in the marketplace and still do business. Next. So 1976, uh, uh, you know, also the emergency was withdrawn and a completely new party took over, the Janta Party. And uh, the Janta Party, of course, uh, was an absolute unknown. Till that time, the country was literally run by the Congress. And uh, Janta Party came in and they did something which also helped us. Next. Next, please. What they did was something interesting. There was a minister then called George Fernandez, and he was totally a socialist. And he said, look, all these global companies are operating in India, like IBM and Coca-Cola. Why are they operating in this country? They shouldn't be here. If they want to be here, they must convert themselves to being Indian companies so that the ownership of the company is more Indian than global. So he gave a notice to both IBM and Coca-Cola and told them that if you can't uh, turn yourself to be an Indian company, please move out. And that was a great opportunity for us because suddenly IBM, the big dada of computers in the country was going away. And IBM those days used to bring in very old fashioned computers into the country. And here we were coming up with a computer in the commercial market with an 8-bit processor. So what we did, moment we saw this thing happening in IBM, we immediately added something to our computer, which was called a data entry machine. And we added a USB for the product, which was called a battery backup, which would mean that if the power failed in the, in the country, and which was very often used to happen those days, the product would still run for a certain period of time. So we added this data entry machine, and as a result of that, we could, in a manner, emulate the IBM machine. And we then started selling into a lot of customers who had an IBM machine, and you could not buy another IBM machine. So that's how it was a very, very lucky break for us that George Fernandez happened. And George Fernandez, I can never forget. Next. So fundamentally, what were we doing at that particular time? Computers was a complete concept sale. People didn't use computers. People had never used computers. 
there, as I said, when we started, there were just 100 computers in the country. And therefore, what we did was that we started to address the first time user market who had not even touched a computer. And it's around the same time that Apple created its first PC. We realized that many years later that we were pioneers in India, but in a manner, we were global pioneers also because we created our first computer around the same time as Apple did. So we addressed this first time user market. This market was a very different kind of a market where they'd never used it in computers before. So we taught our salespeople how to sell a computer, how we could tell them that if you bought a computer, what would be the benefits? And those are the kind of things that we did. We added application software with the hardware so that we could make a full solution for the first time user. Next. Now, as I told you earlier, we had very big competition. We had IBM at that particular time. We had ICL, which is a very large UK computer company. We had Sarabhais running a computer company called ORG. We had Tata's running a computer company called Nelco. And of course, uh, DCM, where we all came from. So competition was around. And a lot of times people ask me, is competition good or competition bad? I think competition is good. Reason for it is that competition makes you stay on your toes. You're always on your toes, number one. Secondly, competition increases the market size. If there are more people selling the same product, the market size increases. So that's really what was happening those days. We had some very high level competition. And here we were a little startup, couple of crore revenue, and we were fighting these giants in India and abroad. Next. Next, please. But as uh, we came into around 1979, 80, uh, something very interesting happened to us and the country. Indira Gandhi came into back into power. And uh, in a plane ride, some of us were traveling to Singapore and um, we met some people from Singapore, from the Economic Development Board. And uh, they said, hey, you guys, what are you doing uh, uh, in India? So we're telling them what we are doing in India. And then all that discussion goes on. And then they said, why don't you come and meet us as you come into Singapore? And uh, so we went to meet them. And they said, if you guys are manufacturing computers in India, we don't have a single computer company making computers in Singapore. Why don't you look at coming and setting up in Singapore and we'll give you all the facilities that you want and we'll give you zero income tax for the next 10 years. So we said, look, we are too small, but uh, we'll look at it. So what we did was that after that, we sent a bunch of people into Singapore. We did some market research and we found out that there was a very interesting market out there in Singapore. And our research clearly showed that a lot of people wanted to buy computers or had computers, but did not know how to use them that well. And they were looking for a solution. So we decided, yes, we will enter Singapore. And I went there with another of my co-founders. We went to Singapore to start the business. And we decided that we will not call it Hindustan Computers Limited there because, you know, those days, India was not really considered a tech country, unlike today. So we said if we use the name Hindustan, it may not really be a good idea. So we renamed the company for Singapore. We called it Far East Computers. And the next thing that we did was that also re re renamed our product and we called it Abacus. Abacus is a very Chinese type of name. And 80% uh, of Singaporeans are Chinese. So we said that will appeal to them. And we also set up the first software factory in Madras. And we decided that our target for the first six months, we had very little money that we could take out of the country. Those days, Reserve Bank of India would not allow you to take money outside. And as it is, we have very little money. So we said, OK, the task for the sales force initially was that in six months, we had to sell a million dollars worth of product. And we launched in a very big way, put out a full page ad, and we said, 
We are not bringing computers to this country. We are bringing computerization. And we gave a whole solution and said, if you buy from us, we will send, give you a full computerization package. And it really worked well. And we did sell a million dollars worth of product in six months. Next. Next, please. So at that particular time, uh, we were really going after, as I said, the India market. And uh, we said, we've done the first salvo into the market, but we need to expand the market. And unless we expand the market, we are not going to be able to sell more. So we said, we again went back and did some basic research. And uh, we figured out that the typical first time user in the country was a single person decision. The, the boss decided what to buy. The, the next point that we discovered through our research clearly was that a lot of people didn't understand computing. They did not understand computers. So we needed to demystify it for the ordinary man on the street. And we needed to break myths. There were a lot of myths around. The first myth was that the computer is very difficult to use. The second myth was that the computer is very expensive and not meant for me. So we said, OK, let's think about a strategy to overcome these uh, myths. And so we created a fantastic advertising campaign. Those days, nobody really used to put up full page ads. But we went around and created full page ads on breaking all these myths. So let me share some of them with you. Please, next. So this is our first full page ad that appeared. And what did it really say? It says even a typist can operate it. Why were we saying that? Obviously. We were saying that if a typist can operate, anybody can operate it. So that was the whole idea. And that's how we started creating the market. So the first ad was this. Next ad, please. Next page, please. The next one was, even if you're a 50 lakh company, you can afford to buy a computer. And why? We had a full strategy to tell them how they can get a return on investment. And our salespeople had an ROI calculator that they actually used to carry with them and would actually sit across the table and calculate for them and tell them in two minutes, how much time will it take for them to get back their investment? Next. And then we started having customers. So obviously, we told them, look, these are the references. If 55 companies have bought our product, you can also buy our product. Next. And for the first time in the country, HCL introduced the concept of EMIs. We actually did a tie up with one of the banking institutions called uh, IDBI. And with them, we went to the customer and said, if you can't buy your product today, by paying the full amount, why don't you take, buy it for 3,500 rupees a month? And that was a huge, huge success because everybody felt that, yeah, I can afford to pay 3,500 rupees a month, which is pretty much what a clerk costs me. So that's how we actually created the market. It's all about creation. And the interesting part is that if you are as a startup out there creating the market, it takes a bit of time. But what it does for you is that you become the market leader. And if you are first in the market, you are always the market leader. So those are the kind of benefits that we started to enjoy. Next. What happened when we put out this campaign out there in the market? We had 10,000 inquiries for the product. I mean, 10,000 those days was a humongous number. And can you imagine the price of the product, which was really, this product was simpler than the simplest phone that you can think of today in terms of power. But it was priced at 364000 which was 18 times the price of the best car that was out there in the market, which was the Ambassador car. So actually, can you imagine that we were trying to sell a computer at 364000 and we wanted to... Uh, really get results. And from this 10,000 inquiries, we started to get a lot of business. Next. Next slide, please. 
But one thing that was there, we had so many inquiries, we didn't have enough salespeople to go out and sell to them. So we said, we, let's, let's do something different. We, I always talk to a lot of startups that don't always look at a one-to-one -one sales strategy. Look at a one-to-many strategy. And that's what gets you more customers in less sales time. Okay. So that's what we did. We created road shows all over the country. We would actually take the computer, hire a, hire a hotel room, put a computer, take a bunch of analysts. We would, we would invite all the people who had inquired about the product. They would come into the, into the room. We would actually show them a demonstration. Once the demonstration was over, we, they would go to the next table, which was called the cooking table. And we had another table after that, which was called the killing table. So the whole idea was that in that, three hour, five hour session, we would actually bring in our customer and close the deal. And really those kind of things we started to do. So cooking and killing was an internal word that we were using to actually make the sale happen much faster than normal. And that's really what got us tremendous results. Thank you. Go on, please, next. So therefore, we were exceedingly successful. And then 1984 happened. 1984, uh, Rajiv Gandhi came into the country and uh, introduced a new concept. He said, all this situation of technology not being allowed in the country should be stopped. We should allow anybody to get whatever they want. So you could actually import a computer. You could import parts of a computer. You could import a license for the software. You could do what you liked. And so what we did was that we quickly shifted to using external technology, using the global software products, operating systems, and we redesigned our product to take care of that. But there were certain things that were happening around in the market at that time. Banks were looking at Unix-based computers, so we decided to design a Unix-based computer. Life insurance company at that stage was wanting to buy a lot of computers, but they could not buy it because their union said, you cannot buy computers because otherwise it will reduce jobs. So what we did was that we took our regular computer, changed a few things in it, made it specific for LIC and we called it an ALPM, okay? Advanced Ledger Posting Machine. By re recalling the product, redefining the product and not calling a computer, the union had no objection and we got a whole bunch of business. And at that time, we also designed our first software product in the country, a relational database, which was far ahead of Oracle. But then we were a very small company. We were a very small market, and it really did not succeed. But we then went on to create our first uh, PC in the market, which was IBM compatible, because IBM compatibility was what was happening all over the world. So within a six-week period, we took a decision to launch our PC because we felt that we should be first in the market. And we call that product the BusyB. The BusyB was the most successful PC brand in the country ever. Next. And you know what happened? In 10 years from starting the company, we became India's largest IT company. We beat everybody, all the large companies, the DCMs, the ORGs, the Tatas, the ICLs, and we beat everybody. And we became the largest IT company in the country. <clears throat> and the data quest gave us a special award for being the largest in the country. Next. In the life of a company, interesting things happen within your country, outside your country, all kinds of Things are changing and change is, as you, as you know, a constant. And you have to put up the change. You have to create strategies which are different when things are changing. And you need to sometimes reinvent yourself from where you are. So in 1989, the Berlin Wall crumbled. In a manner, the Cold War ended. Next. Next. The Dalai Lama at that stage earned the peace prize. And at that time, Sachin made his debut. 
VP Singh became the Prime Minister of India. Next. And what happened around that 89 market is that we had introduced many very good products in the Unix marketplace, which were mini computers. And some of them we were working on new technologies like multiprocessor mini computers with fine grained Unix. And we were happily going along selling into India and uh, we were succeeding. At that particular stage, uh, the famous consulting company McKinsey came into India. And uh, they came to us and said, look, guys, you are the number one computer company in the country. We would like you to be our first customer. So we said, look, you guys are so big, we can't afford you. So they said, no, no, no. We will do like to do a project for you pro bono. You don't have to pay anything. We will do a project for you because we want you as our first customer. So interestingly, they studied our company, they looked at our products and they said, hey, you guys have created such a great product in this Unix, in this Unix machine that you have. Why don't you take this to the US? And here we were, uh, an Indian computer company, 15, 20 crores uh, were, uh, of revenue. And uh, uh, McKinsey comes to us and say, hey, why don't you uh, take uh, go to the US? So sure enough, we decided that we will enter the US market. And uh, we set up a manufacturing facility in uh, Silicon Valley. And we started marketing our product and we got a lot of orders. And yes, there was great acceptance of our Unix product. However, something really difficult happened for us at that particular time. Uh, our, uh, the customer that we had sold to got bought over and uh, the US government came around and said, your product with its power supply is not acceptable in in, in the US for environmental reasons. You need to redesign your product. And there we were sitting with orders, wanting to deliver, manufacturing having started, having taken a loan from ICICI and a $5 million, and we really didn't know what to do. We were absolutely stuck. Here, the great consulting company has given us all these strategies to enter the market, but they've forgotten to tell us that you need this specific thing for selling into the United States. So what do we do? We have set up the manufacturing, we have people, we have started marketing, we got orders, and we could not do anything. So at that stage, we decided that we will quickly pivot to software. And that's really what companies need to do. When they get into an issue or they have a problem that this is what they have decided to do and when they start, and what they have decided to do is not working. Then you look at your resources, you look at your capabilities and take a decision to pivot, which is really what we did. We pivoted to being a software company in America. We put our, those days, really body shopping was the name of the game, where you actually took engineers from India, who put them in American companies and they started to deliver uh, and do software in those companies. So we actually did something different. We went to Hewlett Packard and a couple of large Unix based companies and told them, look, we have great capabilities in multiprocessor Unix. Why don't you look at us for your R&D? And HP's next uh, uh, Unix product was actually pretty much designed by HCL engineers. Next. And again, changes took place in the market. 1990 was an absolute disaster. The Janta government had really created such a huge problem internally. Externally, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Oil prices crashed. The world went into an economic slump. And India was hit with having pretty much no foreign exchange. The Foreign exchange available with India at that stage was just seven days of foreign exchange. So what do you do? You are a computer company, you're manufacturing product, you're importing components, and you have no way to go. Next. 
Next. So, many things happened. Rajiv Gandhi got assassinated, a new government was formed, a new industrial policy happened, and India opened its doors. And India said, you can do what you like, this is the new India, and you can import anything, you can manufacture anything, you don't need licenses, and completely new market got opened up with Narsimha Rao coming in as the Prime Minister. And at that stage, we said, look, we've gone into a, a situation where we didn't have any money to even import components. And so what should we do? We were really down in the dumps. We had to, with great difficulty, import components through friends living abroad as they gave us LC limits and somehow the other we managed. Next. Next, please. So what we did was that we actually at that stage formed a joint venture with Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard had come into the country and we were actually manufacturing a product called Apollo Workstations with, from, with a license from an American company. Apollo Workstations was a com company bought over by Hewlett Packard. So when they came to India and they wanted to start manufacturing large computers and uh, PCs in India and to make workstations in India, we went to them and said, look guys, we've inherited you, you've inherited us, why don't we work together? And so we convinced Hewlett Packard, a huge giant, to work with HCL at that particular time. And that was the time when the world was opening up, the market was opening up in India, people were looking at buying global products. And so we had created a joint venture, which was then called HCL Hewlett Packard. So typically, as they say, joint ventures last seven years. And at the end of seven years, you have a seven year itch and we really did very well. We got them business which they had never dreamt of. The size of the business that we got them was amazing. And uh, we also learned a lot from Hewlett Packard. We learned what is quality. We learned what is a, how does a global company work. So we learned a lot. And we said, this is great learning for us to our, for our next phase of growth. Next. But as this, all this was happening, the telecom revolution had hit the country. And uh, we had even applied for a license to actually uh, provide services for mobile uh, telephony. And we got that license in Tamil Nadu. But unfortunately, our partner, proposed partner, Singapore Telecom, walked out at the last moment and we couldn't get into the telecom business. Well, looking back, maybe it was good. Looking back, maybe it was bad. Who knows? But then at that stage, we said, if we can't get into the services business, let's get into a familiar space. Why don't we go back to our hardware space? And we went to Nokia and said, let's start marketing your product in India. Because as the services take off, the customers would like to buy a lot of phones. And our thought was that if we can bring Nokia into the country, someday we can jointly manufacture Nokia phones also in the country. So that's how we entered the telecom space. Next. And in 1998, as uh, our software business started to grow, and we took the R&D of HCL Hewlett Packard and called it HCL Technologies, we really formally started our software company. Although we had started doing software earlier, as I told you, when we pivoted in America, but that was still a very small operation. But 1998, we decided that, look, in 1990-91, we really got into trouble because we were basically an importing company, country, company, and we needed to have dollar revenue also. So we needed to be in software. So 1998, we then took off and created HCL Technologies from the R&D of HCL Hewlett Packard. Next. Next, please. So in, uh, after having formed HCL Technologies, uh, we worked out that it would be a great idea. The stock markets were really doing well. And it would be a great idea if we could actually take this company and get it listed in New York. So we formed the company. We even created a company in America. Uh, uh, for, for being a registered company in America. And we wanted to go 
to New York Stock Exchange to be the first Indian company to be listed in the New York Stock Exchange. But uh, very quickly, we, are, we figured out that the New York market was not doing that well. But the Indian market was looking superb. So we said, why don't we come back and list it in India? So HCL Technologies, we wanted to list it in 2000 in India. But we still felt that we didn't have enough uh, value created in the company. We didn't have enough back orders in the company. And we needed to do something very different before we actually uh, went for a listing. So what did we do? We did something very, very interesting. You must have, as startups, you must have, uh, you're used to uh, ESOPs, employee stock options. Employee stock options, we, were, we had started in HCL also very early because we used to think far, far ahead of time. So, but at that particular stage, we said, look, if we can't have a large back, uh, back orders, we really will not get, get value for the company. So what did we do? We created a concept for, for customer stock options. And we pick a, picked up a list in America of 15, 20 companies. And we gave them an offer. We said, let's do something like uh, uh, Grandfather, the movie. You should give an offer, people can't refuse. So we said to these customers, if you give us an order for $75 million, we will give you a part of our company. We'll give you stocks in the company. And that turned out to be a fantastic strategy. Pretty much in six months, we started early of 2000. In six months, we had six orders worth $75 million each. And with that backlog of orders, we went into the stock market for a listing. And for the first time in the country, uh, the government allowed 10% of the company to be taken to market. Minimum used to be 25% those days. We went to Ministry of Finance. We convinced them that for software companies, you should not keep this 25% limit. You must reduce that. So we got that changed and we got into the market and we got 12.5 times uh, over subscription. So we had pretty much 23,000 crores, I remember, we collected. Of course, we didn't want that money. So it pretty much created history in the market. But as we were working on the Nokia business, it was really floundering. It was doing very badly. Reason was that those days, you were only allowed to sell phones bundled with software, bundled with services. So if Bharti Airtel was actually uh, selling services, our salespeople used to go and sit outside the Bharti people's offices for hours together to get an order because they would buy in bulk, bundle it with their services and sell. And therefore, we were really having no control on the sale of the product. So we went to the government. We formed something called the... Indian Cellular Association. We were the founder members of Indian Cellular Associations, which has now become very big. And we went and convinced the government that this association wants you to change the rules. And we got the rules changed in flat six months. And we, were, we then broke this business into selling phones separately and services separately. Because if the Bharti Airtel wanted to sell phones, they also had to pay to the government a fee which was called AGR. And as a result, they never wanted to sell phones anymore because there was no money. And so we then started to create a distribution network. We picked up the F FMCG model of levers and created a very big distribution uh, model, completely like FMCG. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Ram Charan, the very well-known uh, management uh, consultant, uh, said Nokia turned to HCL, a personal computer manufacturer, to help crack the distribution nut. And we really cracked it. Okay, next. What did we do? We basically completely changed the pricing strategy for India. I went to Nokia, convinced them to change the pricing. And in two lots of changes, we completely cracked the market. What we used to sell in 
a month, we would start selling in a day. And the other thing that we used, which was very interesting, we called it the ODI model of sales management. What was this ODI model? We would give tasks to all salespeople in the country, and each of them had to do a run rate per day, and everybody had a daily sales target. Now, that totally changed the market. The kind of numbers that we had committed to Nokia, we exceeded them by four and five times. And as a result, Nokia was delighted with the kind of performance that we created in India. Next. The business grew to 8,000 crores, and we took Nokia to a market share of 70%. So that's really what, what you can do if you can actually think about what will make the market much, much bigger. And you should not look always at what is not there. You should always look of what is not there and how do we change the rules of the game to actually make it different. So we created ICA, we went to the government, changed the rules, and we changed the rules of distribution in the country. We created an FMCG model of distribution. We had 140,000 people selling phones all over the country. Today, what you see is all created by XCL. The whole branding of Nokia, everything. We actually introduced a phone in discussion with Nokia because we said, look, a lot of people want a torch in the phone. And uh, they were surprised. They said, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, why do you need a torch in the phone? He said, no. Am I back? Yeah. Yeah. I've got it on the screen. So business really grew. You changed the rules of the market. You changed the rules of the game. And we really became Nokia's largest worldwide customer. Next. 2008 to 2014 was a very different time when we again got, went and created markets and became market leaders in what is called infrastructure management. We created, uh, we want, we were much behind other people in software uh, like Infosys and Wipro. And we said, look, we can't be so small in software. We need to be much bigger. We went and bought eight to 10 companies. We bought the largest SAP company of UK for $800 million. We created uh, the system integration market in India. And we won the largest deal in the country, which was the UID. Actually, all of UID today runs by, is run by HCL. So very interesting work that we did during this period to further increase the market share in India and globally. And uh, today, HCL Technologies, the software company, is the third largest company. We overtook Wipro last year. Next. So today, this is where we are. I mean, we are... Uh, we are a $9.9 .9 billion company. Uh, I sort of uh, uh, left the company um, uh, eight to 10 years, eight years ago, and I decided to start my second innings uh, where I spend a lot of time with startups. I am on the board of Indian Angel Network. I'm part of the uh, Indian Angel Network Fund. I'm also, a I also help the government in certain areas. I'm part of the Electronic Development Fund, which is developing electronics and getting people to invest into electronics. Uh, I'm also deeply involved in the startup area with the FIKI, 
Uh, I am the chairman of the Fiki startup, and we are currently planning to create some very, very new, amazing strategies for startups to look at Fiki as a great support organization for uh, uh, for uh, startups. And uh, we will announce a few interesting things very soon. We are setting up a fund for uh, all those startups who are having trouble during COVID times. So we're doing a lot of new things, and uh, I personally mentor a lot of companies. But I've also been involved in education and a whole bunch of other areas. So very interestingly, uh, HCL today is quite a big company. I don't think I'll go through with another uh, next few slides because I think uh, pretty much we are running out of time. So I'd ri rather leave more time for some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What a journey. I'm sure like so much for our entrepreneurs to learn from this, for starting from a Barsati in the times when getting a telephone was also difficult to, to where ECL is today. I mean, it's no short of a fairy tale. And, and the ups and downs that you face, I'm sure like the entrepreneurs can, can learn from it and how you have pivoted your business model over, over the years. Uh, that's a great amount of, of learning. And, insight for, for our audience. Uh, Gautam, do we have uh, questions to take up from the audience? Okay. Ashwin Rathod asks, yeah, what was yeah. market research? So, uh, basically, market research fundamentally we did by uh, sending a bunch of people who understood solutions. And uh, they went and met close to about 100 prospects. Uh, they listened to them. They actually recorded the whole meetings. Uh, we understood from them what were the needs. And after this basic research that was done, we could really come up with this whole strategy of creating this whole idea of computerization rather than computers. Okay. I guess since we are running out of time, Maybe what we can do is uh, I'd request the audience uh, to send their queries to our email ID, uh, dipp-startup at nic.in. Okay, we have one more question that Gautam has put up. Uh, I hope Somebody so you can see this. put up a question. If you were to start some the same success yeah. journey today from where would you start? Oh, don't ask me this question uh, because uh, <laughs> that's a um, very interesting question in a manner. Uh, I would today look at what are the new opportunities. Uh, uh, COVID has presented some fantastic new opportunities for startups today. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I worked with a startup uh, around March, April, and they wanted to make a van ventilator. And uh, they said, uh, we need to make a world-class ventilator. But uh, normally, it takes about 8, 10 months or one year to two years to make a ventilator. We did that in three months. We put together a complete uh, task force which consisted of around 20 odd people and uh, we had iit kanpur as part of that the startup was from iit kanpur and uh, we created a global team and which used to meet two hours a day and that's the kind of work we did during covid times and flat in eight ten weeks we had a ventilator so you know there are opportunities today huge amount of opportunities in net tech huge amount of opportunities in different areas so the size of opportunities today in India are much, much bigger than we could ever dream of when we started. Okay, so as I was saying, for more questions, we would not bother Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, send us these queries to dipp-startups at nic.in and maybe we'll try to reach sir and, and get those answers if, if needed. And sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable time and these have been wonderful insights. What a great session. What a session. All right. Thank you.